Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the final lecture of our spring 2021 Coffrin Logan Center seminar series. I wanna welcome everyone who's part of our CLC family here at KU and extend a special welcome to our friends of the center who are joining us from other departments at KU as well as the many people who are joining from other universities and other organizations um, all over. So for those of you that are joining us for the first time, the Coffrin Logan Center was established at the University of Kansas in 2018 as a hub to bring together researchers, practitioners, KU students and community partners to address the challenges in addiction. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to explain how a little bit about how today's webinar will work. Uh, Dr. Wickowitz will be presenting her slides on the screen and she'll be able to have video and voice and a selection of attendees have been uh, made panelists and have the option of turning on their video feed while the majority of other attendees are just joining us with uh, attendee mode, so they will not have video or audio. E even so, we ask that everyone mute your microphones at all times, and we will have a question and answer period at the end. So we do expect to have some time for questions, but we, may, we obviously will not have enough to get to everybody's question. It will be moderated by me, so you should ask your questions in the chat window at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, if your question is selected, we likely will call out the names and uh, promote you and give you the ability to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question directly to Dr. Wickowitz. And once again, we will not have time to get to all of the questions most likely. I do wanna thank Sergey and Drew for their coordination and logistical support for all of the seminar series this year. Um, and I do wanna mention an upcoming two-part workshop on systematic reviews and meta-analyses that the Coffred Logan Center is sponsoring. Uh, it'll be offered by Victoria Vota, one of Katie's graduate students and myself. Uh, it's happening next week and then a few weeks later for the second part. And Sergey can put the link to that in the chat. And now I'm thrilled to introduce our final speaker of the spring Coffin Logan uh, Center seminar series. It's really rare that someone's name is so distinguished that it entirely speaks for itself. And Dr. Katie Wickowitz is really one of those people. And I told her I was going to embarrass her. Uh, she's internationally respected as a scientist, clinician, mentor, and advocate for people who use substances. She's the Regents Professor of Psychology at the University of New Mexico and a scientist with the Center on Alcohol Substance Use and Addictions at New Mexico. She trained under Dr. Alan Marlatt and received her PhD at the University of Washington, uh, where she ex received extensive training in relapse prevention but really has moved that to what I think is one of the most interdisciplinary research programs I've ever seen. So she does work in mindfulness-based relapse prevention, quantitative modeling, brain stimulation, other neuroscience techniques, and more recently has really taken on harm reduction as kind of her driving force in her work. She's the editor of the APA Journal Psychology of Addictive Behaviors, a fellow and past president of the Society of Addiction Psychology, um, and I'm not going to list her impressive publications or grants, but just to say that she's in a, a league of her own being cited over 15,000 times, according to Google Scholar. But what I really think distinguishes Katie from a lot of her colleagues is her commitment to mentoring of people of all career stages and all backgrounds. And I've personally benefited from this mentorship uh, throughout my career. And so we are truly lucky to have Dr. Katie Wickowitz joining us today. And we're very excited to hear your talk, Katie. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm I'm now a little bit choked up, so I'll see if I can um, I can get through this, um, Michael. It's it's really great to see you doing so well at KU, and and I've been um, really excited to follow your career since I've I've met you many years ago, and great to see so many wonderful people um, it, here as well in the participant list and and in the attendees. Thank you all for for joining. Um, and, and joining on, on what's another awful day in America. So I, I'd actually like to start by um, taking a moment to acknowledge the deaths of so many black and brown people in America. Um, and I, I wanna invite anyone who is um, struggling to, to leave <laughs> and take care of yourselves. And I'm happy to answer questions via email, the talks being recorded. I'm happy to share papers. Um, I, I, I thought about emailing Michael to cancel today in light of, of more shootings of, of young people and um, particularly a, a now another mass shooting at FedEx last night. So um, I, I, I just had this in my deep in my heart and, and wanted to just take a moment to invite anyone to take care of yourself and take care of your needs. And, and I'm here hopefully 
for the foreseeable future um, and, and, and at my house, you know, so happy to, happy to talk. Um, I, I also wanted to, to give this talk in the context of new data from the CDC this week. Uh, and this new paper um, from Friedman and Acre that just summarizes the um, overdose rates by months. Uh, and, and this is drug overdose deaths. And it looks like we're um, experiencing a, an increase um, in overdose deaths. Alcohol is not counted in these. And I, I'm concerned that, that that's probably even bigger. And, and a lot of my talk today is actually going to focus on alcohol. Um, and what's not reflected in the CDC data yet is a breakout by ethnicity and race, and, and that's concerning. Uh, we are already getting initial looks. Uh, this great paper uh, came out in January on racial and ethnic disparities in unintentional um, fatal and non-fatal emergency medical services in Philadelphia, and starting to see racial and ethnic disparities here. And, and so, I, I, I give this talk with a very heavy heart um, right now, especially, um, and a lot of us also reeling, of course, from COVID. I, I had several family members pass away from COVID in the past year. And, and so I, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the pain and, and struggles in our world right now and invite anyone to, um, to leave and take care of yourself <laughs> the, the, and, and, and your family and, and to hug and call someone who you love. Um, if you're able to do that. So uh, with that, I, I, I am going to give a talk um, and had planned a talk. I, I kind of made some last minute changes. I hope it goes okay. Um, but I did wanna kind of address some of these kind of bigger issues and, and, and it's kind of another piece of my work recently. So I, I will introduce briefly how alcohol impacts health and society. Of course, many of the people listening don't need to, to hear this. Um, I, I'll talk about the early part of my work um, over the last 20 years. This, I, you know, when we, when we hit these marks of, of, you know, 10, 20 years, we start to reflect on our career and what we've accomplished. And so a lot of this talk is kind of me reflecting uh, and kind of where to go next. Um, and so a lot of my career over the last 20 years has really looked at predicting alcohol use and treatment outcomes uh, and really thinking about harm reduction and drinking reduction. Uh, and But kind of how do we put that into action has been more recent work. And then also more recently, I've moved into the, the space of, of thinking about recovery and, and how we are helping people in recovery and how we should be thinking about recovery. And then uh, I'd like to end with just a little discussion about a call to action for, for all of us, um, including some work that I think is really exciting in the field. Uh, I wanna start with terminology. You know, stigma is such a huge aspect of working with individuals who have struggled with their relationship with alcohol and other drugs. And so I, I encourage all of you on this call, if you're researchers, if you're clinicians, if you're students, to, to really give careful attention to our terminology. And, and so I've crossed out the words that, that I don't use and won't be used throughout this talk uh, and encourage you all to think about kind of checking your own terminology when using these terms because they've been shown to be associated with greater stigma and, and stigma towards treatment and treatment seeking. And, and so I'll be using person first language, talking about individuals with alcohol use disorder um, and uh, you know, individuals who experience alcohol related problems or individuals who experience substance or drug use disorder. But even more so, I, I think, uh, and, and I hope one message to get across today is really trying to not only destigmatize but also depathologize addiction, that, that really what we're talking about is, is people who um, have developed a, a relationship with alcohol or other drugs that's not helpful to them. And, and so sometimes they'll come to us for help, sometimes they won't. But regardless, these are people who were potentially seeking something very wholesome and not maybe getting it from alcohol and drugs, but, but that, that their relationship with alcohol and drugs does not define them as a person. And so I think that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, so obviously, substance use disorder impacts millions of Americans. We just looked at the overdose uh, death rates, and, and that's tremendously scary. 
uh, it costs a lot. Uh, and we know that investing in substance use disorder treatment and research saves money. And so good for the Kansas University of Kansas Cochran um, Center and donors to support research and treatment at the University of Kansas. Um, or KU, I, I, it's University of Kansas, but KU, right, Michael? Okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, and so we know that investing in, in substance use disorder treatment and research also saves dollars, um, so that's good. Uh, but we, all, we shouldn't just be focused on that. We also should be focused on the fact that alcohol and drugs cause uh, tremendous morbidity and mortality. Uh, and, you know, a lot of attention is on uh, opioid use disorder deaths and, and now polysubstance use, but really alcohol is a, is a much bigger killer. And, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind um, and really associated with a lot of injury and diseases. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, we, we, we hear a lot about opioid use disorder and the opioid epidemic, but I, but I really think we've had an, an alcohol pandemic for years and it, it's actually also getting getting worse. So um, here's where I'm gonna kind of take a step back in time and for any trainees on the call or on the, on the talk today, um, hopefully this will shed some light on the fact that you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, so, so 20 years ago, uh, over 20 years ago actually, uh, as a first generation college student myself, um, I, I knew two things. I knew I wanted to be a professor of psychology. I had these tremendous professors in my undergrad uh, who I just loved and I, I just wanted to be them. Uh, and, and so Nancy Dodrayom, Jim Trehoyun and Arlene Stilwell were just inspirational to me at my small state University of New York college that I went to as a first generation college student. So I knew I wanted to be a professor of psychology. So, so they told me I had to get a PhD, which I didn't even really know what that meant. And, and I knew I really liked nature and climbing mountains. And so I ended up going to the University of Montana because I got in, which was the primary reason I went there. It's one of the few places I actually got in. Um, but second, I really liked um, where it was situated in Missoula, Montana is beautiful. Uh, but I didn't really know what I was doing or, or what research to do. And so I was very fortunate to um, fall into the lab of Michael Hufford. And Michael Hufford kind of took me in. I, I, my first mentor who I was admitted to work with wasn't actually doing research, but Michael was. So he took me in. And my very first project that he assigned me to was making the phone calls to collateral family members to find out about the drinking of recently um, treated individuals with alcohol use disorder. So we were working at St. Patrick Hospital, people who they had an inpatient program for alcohol use disorder there. And so it was my job to, to talk to the family members and find out how the person was doing and in their recovery and, and what they were drinking. And I, I feel like I learned more <laughs> in doing those phone calls and talking to family members, learned more about recovery than I than I did from many many other aspects of my career, and and so Michael was wonderful. Um, I didn't have interest in addiction at the time, and I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew I liked quantitative methods, and so you know back in the day we had paper copies of everything. So oops, sorry. So Michael um, sent me this paper, and and you can see it's got this little note, Katie, FYI. Um, and he suggested that I test a cusp catastrophe model of suicide risk for my thesis, for my master's thesis. And a cusp catastrophe model is, is from nonlinear dynamical systems theory. And it, it basically is, is a model to explain nonlinear jumps in behavior, such as someone who is seemingly doing okay, and then all of a sudden they kind of have an intention to, to, to take their life to, to, to kill themselves. And so I, I, I was, I don't know, I wasn't super excited about that. Um, you know, it's kind of, it seemed like a, a pretty hard problem at the time. And so I just also happened to be taking psychopathology at the time and, and reading this, this article. And, and I, I really think this article changed my life because it, it introduced the idea of studying uh, alcohol and drug relapse. And so this seminal paper um, by Ellen Marlette and others, um, talked about understanding and preventing relapse. And there was this one quote, and you can see these are actually my notes from, from 20 years ago. Um, Whether the lapse recurs and ends in relapse probably results from a complex interaction of factors, each of which may assume more or less importance. And I said, oh, that's, that's the cusp catastrophe. So ended up kind of 
thinking about this, this nonlinear dynamical systems model for, for understanding alcohol relapse and, and the idea that you could be um, abstinent, but then kind of this confluence of factors would kind of force you to fall off the wagon and, and relapse to, to alcohol use. And so um, this was this was my thesis. Uh, this ended up being my thesis. Shortly before I was going to defend my thesis, Michael Hufford let me know that he was leaving the University of Montana. And and so this was really a, a difficult time. There weren't a lot of faculty there. Um, I had another mentor who um, was uh, more bad things happened with him that I could go into, but I won't. Um, and so I decided to drop out of graduate school at this point. Um, as I said, I, I grew up kind of poor, in po I was first generation, I grew up in poverty. All of my friends and family were, you know, getting jobs and building families. And, and, and it just felt like, you know, things were just not going well at the University of Montana. Multiple mentors had left and there were problems. And so I decided I would, I would drop out of graduate school and, and try to get a job. At a, as a master's level clinician. Um, and so I did that. And, and then uh, luck would have it that uh, I did not become a master's level clinician, obviously, if I'm here talking to you today. Um, but luck would have it that I was giving a poster or I was presenting my, my thesis as a poster at, as a, at a Sunday morning poster session. This is actually the, the poster. It was really beautiful. It was graphically just, you know, wonderful. Um, it's totally, totally boring uh, poster. But for some reason, uh, Alan Marlat came up to it and wanted to hear about my thesis and, and wanted to hear about this project where I was using catastrophe theory to try to understand alcohol relapse. And near the end of the conversation, he asked me what I was doing for my dissertation. And I said, actually, I'm dropping out of graduate school. And not doing a dissertation and, and he said, no, you're you're gonna apply to work with me at the University of Washington. And and so um, I did that and, and got in and, and started over working with Alan uh, at the University of Washington. And so really it was kind of, I, I, I very much feel like I lucked into this, uh, this world of, of studying addiction and it, it's it's been my passion ever since. And so I feel very fortunate to Alan. Uh, and also Mary Larimer, who really took, I feel like really took a chance on, on me uh, at the time. So um, let's see, uh -oh. there we go. So during my time uh, with Alan at, at the University of Washington, uh, I, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about this dynamic model of relapse that we had started working on the cusp catastrophe model proposed a theoretical model of relapse that, that highlighted kind of background distal risk factors and in kind of neurocognitive, neurobiological, neurophysiology, and then kind of the in the moment um, proximal risk factors. So an individual's ability to cope, their kind of experiences of affect and craving, uh, and, and then also, you know, kind of how that might impact substance use in the moment. So, so we started working on this, this theoretical model of relapse that, that took a more kind of situational contextual perspective on relapse. And, and then I proceeded to do a lot of secondary data analyses. And, and I really feel like uh, I've, I built my career on these three data sets. So um, if you're fortunate enough as a trainee to get your hands on some nice data sets, it's a really great way to test research questions that haven't been tested, um, utilizing kind of really rich data sources. So for most of the data I'll present throughout my talk today, and I'll, I'll let you know which, which data they're from, but I'll be focusing on these three, three data sets. So the Relapse Replication and Extension Project were, was the data I used for my uh, dissertation. This was a study that was designed to test Alan Marlatt's relapse prevention model. Uh, and it included 563 people who were recruited from the community. And so this is a really nice sample in that it wasn't an RCT design. It wasn't um, people admitted to a clinical trial. It was just people who were recruited from community treatment programs and then followed for a year after treatment. I've also worked a lot with the Project Match data set. So many people know Project Match. It's a very large randomized clin clinical trial of behavioral treatments for alcohol use disorder. Individuals received either CBT, motivation enhancement therapy, or 12-step facilitation. 
And there were follow-up assessments at three, six, nine, and 12 months following treatment. There's actually, and I'll be presenting some of these data, a three-year follow-up and actually a 10-year follow-up of Project Match that, that I'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, I've also worked a lot with the combined study data, which it was a pharmacotherapy trial that combined pharmacotherapy with behavioral interventions, uh, really elegant design. Uh, individuals were randomized to 16 weeks of medication and followed for uh, 10 weeks, nine and 12 months post-treatment. There's also a three-year follow-up uh, of combined that I'll talk about. And, and then there was a seven to nine-year follow-up. Many people don't know this of combined. Uh, and so we've recently started working with those data as well to try to understand more longer-term outcomes in the context of recovery. So these were my dissertation data. Um, and and I, I love showing this slide. Um, it really highlights that drinking is individual drinking behavior is discontinuous and heterogeneous during and following treatment. And so you can see that from um, kind of zero here, which is baseline prior to treatment to, to month one, uh, many people uh, reduce their drinking, their frequency of drinking. This is percentage of days abstinent on the y-axis. And so many people reduce their drinking to, to near zero, but, but after that, there's just a lot of variability in, in frequency of drinking in this, in this figure. And so we were very interested in what happened after the initial lapse. So, so do people kind of fall off the wagon as was believed, or is there some kind of variation in what happens? And, and what we see is that there's actually a ton of variation. Um, and you can't see that a lot of people return to 100% days abstinent. I wish I could make that line a little bit thicker. But in the months following laps, um, many people um, also show variability in their drinking behavior. Um, and so this red line here is actually the average. And, and this is just to highlight that kind of some quantitative methods might not be as useful for capturing um, the variability in the drinking course over time. Uh, so we actually tested uh, the catastrophe model of, of relapse kind of in the project match data, um, looking at self-efficacy in particular, and so looking at the baseline self-efficacy and self-efficacy change, and, and found that there did seem to be kind of this non-linear dynamic association. Um, I think these data are still, you know, these are still panel data, and so it wasn't the best way to test such a dynamic model, but it was an initial test of the model and, and seemed to, to fit the data well. Uh, I uh, subsequent to that actually collaborated with Seaman Chow at Penn State University because the cusp catastrophe model had a lot of problems. It was a kind of a, a you know mathematical model, but didn't accommodate missing data, didn't really accommodate uh, longitudinal analysis well. So Seaman worked on what she called a regime switching model. Um, and we've, we applied this model to both match and combined data. Um, and, you know, we haven't really used it much, but it's there and she developed um, M plus code that's available with the, with the paper if anyone's interested in, in testing cusp catastrophe models. I, I kind of let those, those go. Um, I, I, I moved to, um, in the combined data, um, thinking about latent Markov models uh, as, as a way of kind of capturing this discontinuity. So Markov models are useful for looking at, at changes in state over time. And so if we think about each person is in a different drinking state at each time point, the latent Markov model can be very useful for assessing those changes in state. Um, from, from time point to time point. And, and what, what this shows is just kind of for people who are engaging in heavy drinking, this particular pattern using a latent Markov model, many people in this pattern were, were engaging in heavy drinking. And, and here was a non-heavy drinking pattern. And here was a, a really interesting pattern of individuals who kind of returned to heavy drinking after a period of not engaging as, in as much heavy drinking. And so I really became fascinated with the latent Markov model as a very useful tool for, for modeling this, this kind of discontinuity in behavior that we were seeing. Um, and, and over the, the time, you know, in the meantime, we were kind of testing these advanced quantitative models but we were also in every analysis kind of looking at predictors and, and trying to understand better what, what predicted good versus bad treatment outcome using this kind of dynamic model of relapse. And, and so we did a lot of work, other people did a lot of work and, and found 
you know, negative affect definitely um, seems to be a prominent predictor. And that, that was something Alan had talked about in his very early work. Uh, but also craving and all of its manifestations. And craving is really tough clinically, you know, or tough as a construct. And, and you know, a lot of work needs to be done to really understand craving better. Uh, it, it's experienced in different ways by different clients. And it's, it's one of those kind of constructs that I think needs work in the field. Um, coping skills has, has been shown to be very important kind of pro, pro, protective factor. Um, substance dependent severity in some samples seems to matter. Uh, interpersonal stress and conflict and also interpersonal support, marital status and support. Uh, self-advocacy, pain. We've been doing a lot of work recently in physical pain, and and you know that's largely been ignored in in the alcohol field. And so we've done some recent work on that, and I encourage more work on that. And then uh, we've also moved into studying opioid use and how that can impact alcohol relapse, and it seems to be a risk factor for alcohol relapse as well. So. You know, at, you know, we've done kind of a lot of work. Um, we've done many more analyses to study kind of change in drinking over time using these longer term data sets, like I mentioned. Um, and I would particularly like to call out Matteo Pearson, Steve Maisto and Adam Wilson, who've, um, who've done a lot of work, this work with me as well as Kevin Hallgren, whose picture is missing, but I uh, wanna call out Kevin Hallgren as well. And what we found is that generally drink, drinking reductions, kind of using these Markov models, latent profile models, mixture models, um, that drinking reductions are achievable and associated with good outcomes, that many individuals who experience drinking lapses tend to recover uh, and still have biopsychosocial outcomes that are similar to those who achieve abstinence. So kind of moving away from, from abstinence as the only desirable outcome based on you know, kind of advanced quantitative modeling, uh, including some of our most recent work that I'll just highlight uh, here, where we found that there, there seems to be this small group, you know, that many people are doing quite well following treatment. And so this is three years following treatment in Project Match, but we replicated this in the combined study. And so when we look at people three years following treatment, about half of them were high functioning and not engaging in heavy drinking. And so that's great, right? That would be definitely consistent with a positive recovery outcome. Uh, but then we, we also found that there's about 15 to 17% of the sample, depending on the sample, that's, that's high functioning, but engaging in some heavy drinking. And they're, they're engaging in heavy drinking about once per week. And heavy drinking here is defined using the NIAAA guidelines of four or more drinks for a woman, five or more drinks for a man. But what we see is when we look at all of these other life health outcomes, that those engaging in some heavy drinking seem to have similar functioning as those who are in, not engaging in heavy drinking. And so there seems to be this group of individuals who are doing quite well, um, even though they might be engaging in some drinking and some heavy drinking. And then there's also kind of our patterns of people who are not doing as well. And, and you know, this first profile, um, profile one is, is a small percentage of people, I think that's important to note, who really is not doing well. Like they are, they have gone back to drinking very heavily and they're not functioning well. Um, profile two is really interesting in, in this replicated in, in the combined study as well. This is a group of people who are not drinking so much, but they're still not functioning very well. And so we've been very interested in this, in this profile. Um, so these are three-year data and these profiles were made with three-year data. But when we look at these longer term follow-ups, and this, this work's all recently been published, so I provide the links here and happy to share the articles. When we look at these kind of, these individuals at three years and then follow them 10 years later in project match or seven to nine years later in combine, we see that actually the profile three and four, these high functioning profiles, regardless of drinking are, are doing quite well with respect to purpose in life and health. And so it isn't the fact that they, you know, like the concern is that those in profile three, they're high functioning at three years, but maybe they're just on their way, right? To, to being off the wagon again, so to speak. But, but that doesn't seem to be borne out in these data. They still show major reductions in their drinking, in, increases in purpose in life and, and really good health. 
again, profile two is concerning. These individuals are actually kind of doing the worst, even if they're not engaging in a lot of drinking, they they're still have pretty low functioning. And so we're currently working um, to understand this profile a little bit more. And, and I'll come back to this at the, at the end a little bit. So, you know, I think this work has been um, really interesting to, to kind of use these advanced quantitative methods to try to understand processes of, of alcohol use and alcohol use disorder recovery. Um, but ultimately, you know, after 20 years of estimating these complex models of alcohol use patterns and predictors, I've, I've spent a lot of time at my computer. Um, I've waited for models to finish running. I've published papers, I've been promoted, um, gotten some grants, but none of this work has actually had much real world clinical implications. And, and so, you know, kind of how do we impact clinical practice? Uh, and, and so that is kind of where I'd like to move for the rest of the talk today in, in talking about how do we impact clinical practice? These, these person-centered dynamical systems models, they're, they're, they're cool, um, they're novel. They take up a lot of computing time um, and they're not really amenable to clinical practice at all. And so, you know, the question is, could we develop potentially a proxy for reduction outcomes that could be used in, in clinical practice? Um, so, and then, you know, we've seen now in these data that drinking reductions seem to be achievable and associated with long-term improvement, but what level of drinking reduction is necessary to show clinical impact? And so I've been very fortunate um, to be thinking about this uh, in the context of regulatory um, guidance. And so, um, you know, if we look at the regulatory guidance, uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, the European Medicines Agency in Europe, and, and regulatory guidance is important for medications, right? It, it, not so much for maybe psychotherapy trials or behavioral interventions in clinical practice, although I do think the FDA and the EMA does guide a lot of the conversations about how do we define success from an alcohol use disorder. And so the Food and Drug Administration has kind of two acceptable endpoints, they're called, or outcomes that they focus on, uh, abstinence and no heavy drinking days. And that's using, again, the, the NIAAA kind of guidance of, of no more than three drinks for women and no more than four drinks for men. So heavy drinking as four or more drinks um, and five or more drinks for men. The European Medicines Agency is interesting. They also have abstinence, but they have um, these intermediate harm reduction goals, including um, one that maybe some of you are not familiar with, which is the World Health Organization risk levels. And I don't have time to go into much about this, but there is a kind of a funny story about how those came to be, uh, which I could share if we have questions, if there's questions. Um, so these reductions, so these are the levels of risk um, based on the World Health Organization. It's based on mean grams of alcohol consumed per day. And so I've been really interested in this endpoint along with the alcohol clinical trials initiative. So I've been very fortunate in my career to kind of be invited into this group, which is a collaboration between the FDA, NIAAA, and several academics, including myself. Um, Ray Anton is, is the leader of the group, Hank Kranzler, Carl Mann, Debbie Hassan, Stephanie O'Malley, and Ray, Ray Litton and Dan Falk from NIAAA. So we became very interested in the World Health Organization risk levels as a potential harm reduction endpoint for alcohol clinical trials. And you know, the idea here is that it, you could work with a patient, and we've actually done this clinically in the clinic where, where I supervise students and, and where we run treatment programs, where you work clinically with, with clients to kind of show them their level of risk and then talk about their level of risk and talk about what level of risk do they wanna be drinking at? You know, do they wanna reduce their drinking to a lower level of risk? And, and so it kind of provides kind of very clear clinically useful benchmarks for, for clients and clinicians. The other thing I really like about the World Health Organization risk levels is that it's based on mean grams of alcohol per day. And so this is a really interesting metric that kind of combines frequency and quantity because let's say on one day, let's say my goal is to be, you know, low risk. And on one day I have five drinks. 
that, well, that's like clearly exceeding NIAAA guidelines. But if I don't drink the rest of the week, I had that one binge day, but I could still be low risk and I could still kind of kind of get back on track. So it takes kind of a, a broader perspective and, and more of a health perspective. Like if we think about healthy eating or exercise, like maybe on Tuesday, I didn't leave my desk, right? I was right here all day on Zoom. But on Wednesday, I was able to go for like a 60 minute hike. Well, that's like, that's great, right? At least I got to get out part of the time. And, and so it really takes into account overall behavior patterns, not so much just did you exceed a specific drink amount on a specific day. So the no heavy drinking days really, you know, you blow it, right? Like once you've had your five drinks, you blew it. And in a clinical trial, that would be considered a failure. Whereas this metric kind of allows you to have kind of a, a pattern of behavior and change your pattern of behavior. So I think it's, it's helpful in that respect. So we've done a lot of work now looking at uh, these drinking reduction endpoints in clinical trials, as well as epidemiological samples. And what we found is the first thing we, we noticed is that it's, it's much easier to achieve this outcome. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that people are more likely to achieve drinking reductions. And so if we look at in the combined study, only 36% of the sample achieved abstinence in the last month of treatment, only 54% achieved no heavy drinking days, but 77% achieved a two level reduction in risk. So they went from very high risk to medium risk. If I go back to the slide, you can see this, or high risk to low risk. So they, they achieved at least a two level reduction in their risk. And so treatment looks much more successful, right? And, and, and people have achieved this reduction and it acknowledges that, that people are reducing their drinking and reducing our drinking is associated with improvements in health. And then if we look at a one level reduction, that's much e even easier for people to achieve. But, you know, if, is this drinking reduction really meaningful is, is the important question. And, and yes, um, we have done several studies now. Uh, Debbie Hassan's group and my group have been very busy in, in looking at validating these WHO risk levels in, in using data um, in collaboration with the Alcohol Clinical Trials Initiative. And what we found is that reductions in World Health Organization risk levels are associated with reduced risk of alcohol dependence, decreases in drinking consequences, and improvements in mental health, improvements in quality of life, blood pressure and liver function, reduced risk of lizard, liver disease, depression, and anxiety. We, we show that um, using the WHO risk level reductions, you, you can show medication treatment effects over placebo. And our most recent work, which is under review now, is, is looking at reductions in healthcare costs. We've also found that these reductions in, in risk levels are stable over time and achieving the re reduction in risk and the stability of reduction in risk is not moderated by alcohol dependence severity. I'll also add that every reviewer of every paper makes us uh, conduct the analyses without abstainers included, because when you think about it, like reductions in risk are also, you know, people who are reducing are also those who are abstinent. And so all of these findings are consistent whether or not we include or exclude abstainers from the models. And, and so this seems to be a, a, you know, a useful metric that, that I think is clinically relevant that clinicians can use in clinical practice to capture reduction in risk and improvements in, in drinking outcomes. So I, I kind of want to move to uh, the soapbox stage of, of the presentation where I talk a little bit more about why I think this is important um, from a public health perspective. Um, and, you know, it was two years ago almost now that the, or over two years ago now that this global burden of disease risk factors study came out and blew up the headlines because all of a sudden you can have any drinks and, and any drinking was associated with increased risk of morbidity and mortality. And of, of course, many of us knew that, right? We knew that any drinking generally um, is, you know, especially at higher levels was associated with increased risk of morbidity and mortality. And I had um, aunts and, and calling me my older aunts and being like, can I not have a glass of wine anymore? Um, and, and I had a, a very older woman come up to me after a talk, a public lecture I was giving, and she was like, but I really like having wine at church. Can I still have my wine at church? Um, and, 
you know, I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can have the wine at church. Um, but but so I, I think it's really unfortunate that the headlines were the way they were, because if you read this graph from right to left, you will have a very different headline. If you read this graph from right to left, the headline would be, if we reduce our drinking, we will have reductions in relative risk of morbidity and mortality. It would have been a much different headline. And I, and I really think we need to focus more on changing the conversation towards that um, and, and moving towards um, thinking about all of us reducing our risk of, of morbidity and mortality by all of us striving to have drinking reductions. And, and we have this really weird culture that glorifies heavy drinking, you know, that there's this drink, drink, drink culture. And, and that's really at odds with an abstinence only model. And so it, it really creates a, a terrible situation where for individuals who struggle with their relationship with alcohol, they're bombarded with alcohol images, also told they have to be abstinent and can never drink again. And all of it is is very frustrating. And I think we need to find some, some middle ground or the middle way or the middle path. Um, and, and this becomes really, you know, I think important when we think about the prevalence of alcohol use and alcohol use disorder in the United States currently. So um, these are 2015 data. I need to update this with the most recent data, of course. Um, but this hasn't changed too much. Um, most uh, adults in the US drink alcohol in, in the past year or past month. Uh, about a third engage in binge levels or heavy, heavy drinking levels. And, and only 12% meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder. Of those who meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder, about 65% are in the mild range. Um, so two to three symptoms of alcohol use disorder. And so, so we have a treatment system that really is catered towards 35% of 12% of people with an alcohol use disorder, who, that you know, a treatment system is really catered towards very severe alcohol use disorder, and and so because of that, a lot of people don't seek treatment and don't want treatment. And so when we we look at it, you know, the treatment gap for alcohol use disorder is quite large. Most people with alcohol use disorder do not receive treatment. It's about eighty percent um, who do not receive treatment. And then when we ask people of who meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder, why they don't seek treatment, the majority say they don't want to stop drinking. And so we have this situation where uh, we have many people who drink alcohol without problems. The majority of people who even drink alcohol with problems don't want to stop their drinking. And all of this clinical trial data that I just presented showing that drinking reductions actually can be, can be really important important and associated with improvements in health and functioning. So, you know, I really think about the public health impact of, of retaining and, and perpetuating an abstinence only model. And so if we think about, um, and this is just a kind of thought experiment, you know, 12% of individuals with alcohol use disorder in the US, it's about 30 million people. If we, you know, if about 20% of them are seeking an abstinence-based treatment, that's 6 million people with an alcohol use disorder, and then of those, 36%, going back to kind of who achieves abstinence from the combined data, if we think 36% of people are going to achieve success with abstinence, then, then we're serving about 7% of people with alcohol use disorder, 2.2 million people. So what if we had a drinking reduction model instead? Well, we've got those same 12% of people with an alcohol use disorder, but now maybe 50% of them um, of those 80% who weren't going to seek treatment before, maybe about half of them might seek treatment because now there's this drinking reduction treatment available to them. And that's their goal. That's what actually what they want. So now we're helping about 12 million people with an alcohol use disorder. And if about 70% of them achieve success with drinking reductions, which we saw in the combined data, well, now we're helping 9.2 million people or 30% of people with alcohol use disorder. So if we include kind of the, the last group of people who wanted abstinence, we help them achieve abstinence. And this group of people who want drinking reductions, we help them achieve drinking reductions. We're almost to 40% of the population with alcohol use disorder providing services and helping them reduce their drinking. So how does this fit into recovery models? So moving kind of from immediate treatment 
models to a recovery mindset. And uh, it turns out not super well. Um, so Hazleton Betty Ford defines recovery as a voluntary, voluntarily maintained lifestyle characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. And of course, you know, most treatment programs that you go into in the US in the community are gonna have the 12 steps on the wall. Uh, AA um, notes its primary purpose is to stay sober and help other people with alcohol use disorder achieve sobriety. And, you know, I could go off on a tangent on this. Um, I won't, but I, I will say that what if there was an alternative? What if we could have drinking reduction fit into these recovery models. And NIAAA is working on this. So I give NIAAA a lot of credit. They're working on a definition of recovery that does not solely focus on abstinence. SAMHSA also has um, come out with a definition of recovery that doesn't solely include abstinence, although it does give abstinence as an example. Um, but I really think if, if we wanna have a public health impact on alcohol use disorder, we need to think beyond abstinence as a definition of recovery. First of all, requiring sobriety uh, perpetuates this us versus them stigma of the disorder, right? So I can drink as much as I want as long as I don't have an alcohol use disorder and alcohol use is glorified. And then if I have an alcohol use disorder, I can never drink again. And that really perpetuates the stigma. It also perpetuates stigma of, and something I hear really commonly from friends and colleagues who don't drink because they don't wanna drink, not because they don't have an alcohol use disorder, but they, they don't like alcohol or they don't wanna drink, is that they constantly have to explain why they're not drinking. And, and so it's like this really interesting thing where as a society, wouldn't it be better if all of us thought about drinking reductions for health, you know, to improve our, our public health? I also think some of the focus on citizenship and service is misguided. There's, there's some great data out of Australia and out of England on, on kind of expecting superhuman recovery, where, where people in recovery are expected to be these, these superhumans who are giving back to their community and doing all the service and citizenship and, and, and not kind of recognizing the, the causes and conditions that led them to develop an alcohol use disorder might also make it hard for them to, to be these phenomenal superhuman citizens. People who are these phenomenal superhuman citizens in recovery are, you know, I give them so much credit and fabulous, but I, I think requiring that is also a little bit misguided and concerning. And, and just more generally, I think we need to shift from a pathology-based model to a strengths-based model and, and really depathologize and destigmatize addiction broadly. Um, and we've written about this in, in a recent paper that you can see. And I just want to go off on a little bit of a side, side bit around depathologizing. We, we do a practice as part of the mindfulness-based intervention work that I do, which asks people with alcohol use and other drug use disorders to, to tell us about kind of their original reasons for why they, why they use substances. Why, how do substances fit in their life? Why do they reach for a substance? And what we hear are things like relief from pain, wanting social connection, wanting to be numb or to get away from the stressors in their life, wanting to feel joy, wanting to have fun, and we put all of these up on a board, on a whiteboard when we're in person or weird Zoom whiteboard now in, in these days. But, and it's really interesting to look at the, these lists because it's, it's these really kind of wholesome human needs that people are looking for. That, you know, who doesn't want relief from pain and stuff, you know, and, and who doesn't want to get away from stressors and struggles? Who doesn't want to feel social connection? Who doesn't want to feel joy and fun? That these are very wholesome, human needs. And, and so what if we start there? And, and of course the substances, everyone says the substances don't give them this, but what if we start there with kind of meeting these basic human needs that people are, are turning to substances for? Could we actually help people in, in almost a prevention mindset from going down the road to developing problems with alcohol and drugs? So, you know, I think we really need to shift our attention from the target of drug use, which has led to all sorts of problems, to targeting the causes and conditions. And, and so, you know, I think about kind of the broader systems in which people live and exist and, and how do we engage those broader systems of care. And 
this is really important work that that just came out on on looking at some of the state policy interventions that were designed to reduce opioid use disorder overdose deaths and there was a lot of intended cons unintended consequences including increased deaths from cocaine and synthetic opioids um, include and also kind of in places with inc decreased prescribing increases in heroin overdoses so it's kind of, again, seeing that supply side reduction as, as like the war on drugs or, or now state policy interventions designed to reduce supply of opioids has actually had unintended consequences. And, and that it's really imperative, as this paper says, that we start to address the fundamental causes, the lack of economic opportunity, the physical and mental pain that people are experiencing, these causes and conditions that cause people to have harm in their lives from substances. So um, I just wanted to highlight a few um, studies that have come out in, in the last year that I'm really excited about for kind of thinking about expanding access and care and focusing on broader communities. So Ayanna Jordan is doing, and just received a grant, is doing great work on kind of meeting people where they're at in, in, in a black church and, and not expecting people to come to them, but meeting people where they are. Um, uh, other really great work on harm reduction um, in people who are chronically homeless and, and really drinking at very high levels and, and meeting them where they're at and helping them reduce their drinking. Um, cultural centering is another piece. You know, most of our treatments for alcohol and substance use dis disorders were developed for and by white people. And we really need to expand the reach by, by working within communities to culturally center and tailor our interventions. Uh, I, I recently just completed a book with Jilly Tucker, and so I'm really excited about it because we actually kind of take the, the next step of redefining recovery from alcohol use disorder using a multi-level and multi-systems approach. Um, and that's gonna be coming out hopefully soon. Um, and if you ever get the opportunity to do a sabbatical with someone else, it was really a, an amazing opportunity. She came to UNM and we got to kind of meet and talk together uh, and, and develop these ideas about, um, Jaylee has a master's of public health. So develop these ideas about how to bring public health to this discussion. I'll end with just one more slide, sorry. Um, you know, I think we need to develop and dis disseminate culturally centered treatments that target drinking reduction, that are open to drinking reductions. I think we need to consider non-abstinent reco recovery and, and whether that can help reduce stigma, improve access to care, and also the desire to seek treatment. And then I think all of us need to be focusing on actively working to study and eliminate um, racial inequality inequities that were created and are maintained by white supremacy in a system that was really designed for and by white people. And looking at social determinants of health and systemic racism and how that is impacting people um, in systems of care um, and creating barriers to wellness. So with that, I wanna thank uh, all my fabulous students and, and trainees over the year and, and over the years, and of course all the funding and thank all of you for listening. I'm sorry, I went a little bit longer than I thought I would. Uh, happy to take questions. Wonderful presentation, Katie. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to go ahead and ask questions instead of the kind of merry-go-round of, of promoting and unmuting people. Um, and I'm sure as well that Katie would be happy to entertain questions by email if people didn't have a chance to get their question heard. Uh, so the first question today, um, and we do have about four or five we're going to try and get through, so maybe uh, keep that in mind with your length of your responses. So um, it's from Stephen Lisman. He's asking about uh, documented changes in quality of life. Do those measures include marital and family satisfaction or quality as part of what they assess? Yeah, they actually do. Um, and, th and that's been a question because a lot of our research is based on self-report. And, and so we don't necessarily have the family perspective. Um, but we have found that that the patient's report of their family interactions are also improved and quality of life is also improved in their family interactions. I would love if anyone has data with, with collateral informants and, and family members to report, I would love to look at whether drinking reductions are also associated with family reported improvements in quality of life, because I, I suspect they are based on the, the self-report. That's a great question. Wonderful. A question um, or kind of a question and a comment from Steve Sussman. Um, he's wondering if you could discuss the research 
that deals with people who really can't drink alcohol again. So for people that, you know, um, any amount of alcohol may be problematic due to personality changes or legal trouble or, or how that plays into this, the recommendations that you might give. Thanks, Steve. Hey, Steve, good to, good to hear from you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think there's, um, a re- it's a really good point. So there's kind of this sick quitter effect that we, we see in some of our data where individuals who are really not functioning well, but, but can't drink. And, and I've talked to a lot of liver docs who are like, people can't, you know, they get to a stage where they can't reduce. They, they absolutely have to abstain um, for liver health or, or they'll die. Or, or people, like you said, with, with criminal justice involvement, who if they drink, there's kind of severe consequences. Unfortunately, that's a whole other talk on why we need to change the criminal justice system. Um, but I, so w- I will say two things. One, I think, um, I, I really think if we implemented these kind of drinking reduction approaches, people wouldn't get to that stage. Right, so, so what happens is people don't wanna quit drinking so they don't go to treatment and then they get to the point where they have to stop drinking to, altogether because they can't reduce um, because their health is so impaired. So, so one is a prevention mindset that we would prevent that from happening. Um, second, you know, there is this kind of belief that people with very severe alcohol use disorder can't reduce. And we actually aren't seeing that in our data. And, and so it's clinical trial data. Um, maybe that's the problem, but Susan Collins and Seema Klifisefi, their data with very um, severe alcohol use, people with very, very severe alcohol use disorder um, are showing that people are able to reduce and maintain reduction. So I think I think there is a, a belief in our field that is not substantiated by data um, in a lot of cases. Okay, great. We have two more questions. Um, one is from Laura Holt, and she's asking, there seem to be numerous apps and websites and other resources available to help people reduce their drinking. What roles do you think these tools might play and also, is this the future or should we be thinking more about in-person support options for harm reduction? Thanks, Laura. And hello, Laura. Good to hear from you too. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they have such a big role to play. We have to get people to use them, right? Um, and I'm really excited um, about many of the applications and, and apps out there. I think they could play a huge role in continuing care, like the HS app for recovery support services. Um, also, uh, you know, I think digital therapeutics is definitely um, a great way to reach people who are reluctant to go to treatment and, and could really fill this gap of, you know, right now we, we do have a, an infrastructure of a treatment system that's for very severe alcohol use disorder. Um, maybe the digital therapeutics could fill the gap of the 80% who maybe don't need residential or intensive outpatient treatment would really benefit from um, a, a, you know, a digital program. And so I see, I see great future in that. Uh, I, I, you know, as much as the pandemic has been really hard, it's, it's shown us what we can do online and via telehealth. And we've moved our treatment program to be telehealth. And so far it's going really well. I, we'll see what the data looks like when it's done, but I do see a lot of um, exciting new directions using technology and I think the, the struggle is, is the adherence and engagement piece, right? Like how many of us have apps on our phone that we never open, um, including, I think I've downloaded like six drinking reduction apps just to see what they're like and I, I've never actually used them. And, and so I think we, we all need to be kind of targeting some funding towards adherence and engagement with those therapeutics. Great, and the final question comes from one of our trainees. Uh, so Fernanda Oda asked, um, she thanked you for a wonderful presentation, but she um, was interested more about if you could reflect on the, the impact of COVID and what that might mean in terms of um, some of the data that were collected over the last year, year and a half, how it might impact risk levels for um, alcohol use. You know, a lot has changed in the way that people are drinking and their access to alcohol. Um, can you maybe just reflect a little bit on that? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And thank you for that. Um, I mean, so the data are interesting, right? Like there's definitely people who have increased, um, particularly women um, have increased and other people who have decreased. Um, I, th- I think the upside of COVID has been this move to telehealth, tele um, recovery support services, um, kind of greater access to those. But I, I am really concerned about the, the, you know, the effects and, and we don't know what's gonna happen. I, 
I, you know, one hypothesis is that when life returns to normal, people kind of return to their prior behavior patterns. I think that's a little bit hopeful um, and maybe too optimistic. An another concern is that more people have developed problems and, and I showed the overdose death data for drugs, but I, I suspect it's actually probably worse for alcohol. Uh, so I, it, you know, these are really horrifying times. And, and I think, I think the only upshot and good side of COVID is, has been the increased access to telesupport and telehealth services and, and increased kind of openness to, to that possibility as a way of delivering care. Okay, so I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Katie Wickowitz for joining us for our final talk of the 2021 spring um, Coffin Logan Center seminar series. It was so great to see the audience. I think we I don't, didn't see the peak number, but we were above 100 for a bulk of the presentation. So that's wonderful. Um, we hope to re resume our in-person work uh, seminars in the fall, um, but we are actively looking at ways to make them kind of a hybrid model so we can continue to make this available to um, people to join us from outside of KU and outside of um, our kind of Coffin Logan Center community. So thank you, Katie, and thank you for everyone for joined. Um, Sergey also just put the link to our um, strategies and practical tips for conducting systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Uh, Tori is actually the one in the pink shirt there in the middle on Katie's slide. <laughs> She'll be joining me next week for a workshop and then again in a couple weeks after that. It is free. There's not many opportunities to get a free workshop on systematic reviews and meta-analyses out there. So please join us um, on Zoom and thank you once again, Katie. Thank you all. And definitely check out Tori. She's a superstar. Uh, so thank you all. Have a great day, everyone.